Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Good afternoon and a warm welcome to this program presented in conjunction with the exhibition Rosie Lee Tompkins, a retrospective at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, where it will still be on view when the museum reopens, hopefully this spring. I'm Sherry Goodman, Director of Education, and I'm pleased to introduce our two presenters, Carolyn Maslumi and Aura Clay, and Elaine Yao, who will frame and moderate their conversation. Dr. Carolyn Maslumi is a major force in the world of African-American quilts as an artist, author, historian, and curator. In 2014, she received the nation's highest award for traditional arts, the National Endowment for the Arts National Heritage Award. The newest of her honors came just recently when she was named a 2021 United States Artists Fellow. Dr. Maslumi is the founder of Women of, Co of Color Quilters Network, whose latest exhibition, which she curated, is Gone But Not Forgotten, Remembering Those Lost to Police Brutality. Aura Clay is a quilt and fiber artist and a leading member of the African American Quilt Guild of Oakland. A former student of the noted quilter Marion Coleman, she has exhibited locally and nationally, including in the Gone But Not Forgotten exhibition. One of her quilts titled Black Filmmakers Hall of Fame was pictured in the New York Times article about the African-American Quilt Guild of Oakland. Elaine Yao is the co-curator together with Lawrence Rinder of the Rosie Lee Tompkins exhibition, organized during her time as the BAM PFA Andrew W. Mellon Postdoctoral Curatorial Fellow. She's currently the museum's associate curator of the Eli Leon Trust collection of African-American quilts. Following the presentations and discussion, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions. Please use the Q&A function to submit them. And now Elaine Yao. Thank you so much, Sherry. Um, just give me a moment and I'll share my screen for some slides. 
Great. Um, well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, today we have the privilege of hearing from two women who bring deep knowledge of and experiences with quilts to concert. Uh, they are not only artists, but members of two networks of quilters that are actively shaping and continuing traditions of quilting into the present. We've invited them today to help us contextualize some of Rosie Lee Tompkins' work within African-American quilt history and contemporary practices. Uh, BAM PFA's retrospective has highlighted Tompkins' unique aesthetic achievements in textile art. But in addition to these, her work bears out many themes that have sustained African-American quilters for centuries. And these are themes along the lines of storytelling, spirituality, family, and community. Now, some of these links are obvious, um, while others lie beneath the surface of what we see in Tompkins' work. Uh, so to help guide our way into understanding some of these mentions, I'm really delighted now to hand over to Carolyn and Aura, who will give short presentations before we jump into our larger discussion. Uh, so with that, um, Carolyn, I am happy to advance your slides and feel free to start. Please, the first slide, thank you. First of all, I'm happy to be here. I'm always happy to talk about quilts. Um, I want to talk about the quilts of Rosie, uh, not in comparison to other quilts, but in so far as style, but just talk about the themes in which um, artists make their work. And many of Rosie's quilts are dedicated to religious themes. And <clears throat> for people that were in bondage, the Judeo-Christian religion with its emphasis on renewal and rebirth became a source of tremendous comfort uh, and release for Black folk. Religion sustained them through slavery. It helped them cope with the oppression of their daily lives and just became a very important force in the survival of um, African-Americans here. These first two quilts, um, I paired them together. Okay, these, I paired them together because of the found objects on these quilts. Um, the next two pair are, are about uh, spirituality, but a lot of Rosie's quilts contain found objects. And I love quilts uh, that have found objects on them. I love narratives. And the quilt on my left is by Latifa Shakur, who works at a recycling company. And all of the pieces in her quilt are recycled objects and recycled fabrics, buttons, beads, and found objects. And then on the right, you have Rosie's quilt, which is um, a similar format in that she has found objects and pieces of beading and uh, different types of recycled fabric in her work. Can I have the next slide? Okay, now we get into the uh, spiritual aspect of Rosie's quilts. I think it, it seems that the majority of the quilts in her lap, the latter years of her life dealt with her religious beliefs. And for me, looking at her work and knowing her psychological condition, I think these quilts were a retreat and um, a retreat from within her own mind of safety through her uh, belief in God, her belief in Jesus. The only thing lacking in the body of her work is her voice. And to me, that's a, that's a glaring hole 
in, in Rosie Tompkins work. On the other side, you have a quilt by Viola Burley Leak, and that quilt is called Redemption. And this artist too works in an improvisational type style. But the artist has made a statement about this quilt. And she, in talking about this quilt, says that she believes every human being has a second chance to make things right. And everybody can be redeemed. And redemption is about uh, all about second chances. And the quilt portrays a man freeing himself uh, and asking for salvation. He's tasted the forbidden fruit. And the beautiful thing for me in this quilt is that I hear the voice of Viola Burley Leak. <clears throat> With Rosie Tompkins quilts, I look at the quilts and I have to assume and guess and really think deeply about how she's feeling about her religion. And I see it as a cloak, a safeguard, a protection um, again from the world that's around her in, in her Sometimes I think confused thoughts. Next. This is another piece uh, on the left by another artist who uses spirituality themes and a lot of her work, Gwen Ockley Brooks. And <clears throat> like Rosie, she uses Gwen uses a lot of found objects in her work and recycled fabric. She never uses new fabric and everything is hand done. She never uses a machine and most of Rosie's work is hand, uh, hand sewn. So both of these women are seeped in spirituality and that's the comparison of these two pieces. Next. Next slide. <clears throat> Rosie Tompkins is known for her improvisation. And for those that don't know, improvisation means being able to make a quilt without the use of a pattern. And on the left, I have some comparisons well, not comparisons, but people that uh, make improvisational quilts that are members of the Women of Color Quilters Network. Edgenetta Miller was one of the first people that I knew to make such quilts. Next. A lot of Rosie's quilts uh, have this blue and yellow and red color in them. And really it's just an explosion of color. And this improvisational type of quilt, this style really unites the most popular artistic forms of our culture. The fabric just explodes, the color explodes and the patterns are sometimes hard to discern, but they have, they have a logic all their own. And the mismatched uh, swatches seem to flow together and they end up in a very pleasing whole uh, quilt. They're, uh, they're clear patterns though, if you look at that work very hard and G's been, actually put improvisational quilts on the map. When people first saw those quilts, they thought they were shoddy and poorly made quilts. And now they are accepted as works of art and everybody's trying to make these types of quilts. But it's something about the sponta spontaneity of Rosie Tompkins quilts. And I have to say, Initially, when people looked at the G's Ben quilts and thought, oh, this is just shoddy, poorly put together work, it is not easy 
to make an improvisational type quilt. They, they require a high degree of skill. It's not easy putting these haphazard parts together to make that whole and, and come out with this uh, fabulous work. On this other side, we see a, a piece by Adrienne Cruz, and she's a member of the Women of Color Quilters Network and uses cloth that she's dyed in her work, but all of her pieces are improvisational. And the next two slides are Adrienne Cruz's work. And again, you see the improvisation. And like Rosie, she has a prevalent, uh, she loves to use certain fabrics, certain fabric colors. And that for Adrian would be orange, red, and cobalt blue. You'll find those uh, colors in her work next. As I said, this is a similarity in colors and uh, the work is quite, quite explosive and it's just, it's absolutely stunning. And I admire anybody that can make improvisational quilts. I can, but I can appreciate, I, I can appreciate the work of others. Next. Rosie used a lot of um, different kinds of fabric, but she had a uh, love, it seems, for velvet. And this quilt has a lot of velvet in it. And again, in this imp uh, improvisational style. The quilt on the other side is by Sanji Hunt, and it was made for a show that I curated on jazz and quilts and how they relate to each other. Sanji Hunt, when I asked her to participate, she told me that she didn't understand jazz. And she made, she came up with this quilt and it's called There Is No Melody to Follow. And I put this quilt in to just compare the style. To me, this quilt is very tight with its, uh, with its design and there's not the abandon and freedom that Rosie's quilts have. And when I look at the background of Sanji Hunt, she's an MFA. And I think, I think maybe that's why her quilt tends to be a little more structured, but also too, she said she couldn't understand jazz, so that makes a difference as well. And next. Many of Rosie's quilts deal with her family and icons within the uh, African-American community. These are like praise songs to me, um, celebrating people that are important to us and who touched our hearts and minds and spirits. Peace on the left is in honor of four young girls that were killed in 63 in Birmingham at, um, in the church, 16th Street Baptist Church. And that church was bombed and those little girls died. And with Rosie's quilts, you see King and the Kennedy brothers in the center. And those are people, three men that I'm sure that she held close to her heart. And they were, um, she thought a lot of them. She made this quilt to celebrate their lives. Next. This is my favorite Rosie Tompkins quilt, my absolute favorite. Um, I, I love narratives. I love a quilt that has a story. And this quilt talks about two men that Rosie uh, holds dear to her and 
I remember the OJ case, a lot of elder African Americans thought that he was framed. So uh, she has him in this quilt and then she, um, okay, she has uh, some of the civil rights leaders as well. And they're surrounded by Bible quotes. And I think that's there for protection, probably. But Rosie Tompkins left no record of her pieces. So we really don't know. We have to assume. And so she's celebrating these, these men in her quilt. And on the other side is a quilt by Dinga McCannon. And she's celebrating Althea Gibson and her narrative quilt. So a lot of the quilts that African-Americans make celebrate our heroes, sheroes. And I often say that quilts are like uh, cultural and historic documents because you look back at these quilts and get a glimpse into how we've led our lives and what's happening in our nation, in our community and with our families. So this is one of the reasons why quilts are so important. Next. This last quilt is also uh, like a praise song and it's uh, in homage to all those African-Americans that were lost in Hurricane Katrina. And again, this is a type of improvisational quilt. So I found in the 40 years I've been working with quilts and collecting quilts that the narrative quilt is one of the most predominant types of quilts. So I will end with this. And um, I, I think we're fortunate to have all of Rosie's quilts in one place where people can study those quilts. And this is very necessary because we don't have a record of an extensive record of Rosie's voice with these quilts. So that the quilts are there at the museum and scholars and historians are privileged to come and study those quilts. I think that's important because it will give us a, hopefully a deeper glimpse into the life of Rosie Lee Tompkins. Uh, we need that. We need that. That's missing in, in the collection. Her voice is missing. Carolyn, um, thank you so much for showing these tremendously rich examples. Um, I do, there is one question that is specific about the things you showed that I thought I could ask now before we jump to Aura. Um, somebody asks, it would be great to know the dates of some of these contemporary works. You might not have that at your fingertips, but could you just give us a ballpark? Are these sort of- I can, things? I can, yes. Um, this particular quilt that we're seeing now, that quilt is seven years old. And I know because it, it, was, it was in one of my uh, traveling exhibitions, I commissioned it. So, and I, I also want to say too, I'm glad somebody asked that question because it's important, it's very important that quilts are labeled. Um, and if they're not labeled, that we as uh, collectors and curators seek out that information, the maker and where the quilt was made and the date that it was made. That's, that's very important to uh, identify each one of these quilts. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and I'm sure as more questions come up about specific um, images that you've shown to our audience, please do feel free to keep posting your questions. Um, and I will either raise them and or pass those along. Um, but for now, um, Aura, shall we, shall we move on to you? <laughs> thanks, Elaine. Um, and thanks, Sherry, for that nice introduction. And I want to say first, I'm really proud to be on this panel with Carolyn. She is my hero. So um, we will get started. Can I see the first slide, please? I visited the museum last year, um, the first weekend in March. 
of 2020. And um, I got a chance to actually see this exhibition. And just after that, the museums were closed and art galleries were closed. So I'm fortunate that I did get a chance to see this. Uh, as I was looking at this quilt and, you know, and Carolyn talked about this quilt too as her favorite, but as I was looking at it, I was thinking sort of the same thing she talked about. What's the story behind it? What is it we're looking at? What is it we see? What is it we don't see? And some of the things we see, you know, are the people in the quilt. Also the name Effie, and I noticed that Effie's name is there, but we're saying Rosalie Tompkins. So again, this is another story about this quilt. Why did she um, put the name there? You know, that's a real name. Also, um, when we're talking about looking at quilts and being at a gallery or a quilt show, it's always great if the artist is there, especially at quilt shows, if the quilter is there, we get to ask questions and get another layer of understanding of what the quilt is about. And as Carolyn mentioned, we don't have Rosalie Tompkins' voice as such, but we can stand in front of the quilt and try and fill in that story. Um, and we can see that she's commenting on what's going on in her world, in the community, politically. So we can sort of fill in that story. And when I worked with Marion Coleman, who was in the master quilter, um, I was her apprentice and we were funded by ACTOR, which is the Alliance for California Traditional Arts. Her advice to me always when I was making a quilt is that we have a duty to tell our story. What is our story? So when you're standing in front of a quilt, that's sort of what are you asking? What are the stories behind this quilt? What is the story of the quilt maker? Next, please. As I was looking at the quilt that we saw, this is a detail of that quilt. And it was just later that I noticed that there's a section of quilts that's made out of neckties. And I'm going to talk about neckties a little bit later, but I didn't see this first time I looked at it. And I only noticed it when someone else wrote that she applicate necktie fabric on the surface of this, of this quilt. And we've been talking about repurpose and upcycle and recycled and abandoned. So this is all part of the story when we're looking at a quilt. In fact, my brother reminded me that when my mother quilted, she kept a bag of scraps. And as she quilted, she would pull out a scrap and sew it together. And once the quilt was finished, we noticed that, oh yeah, here's a dress that I wore last Easter or two Easter's ago, or here's a shirt that my brother wore the first day of school. So again, the quilts have another life, you know, other than the life they had before. Next quilt, I'm sorry, next slide. And these two quilts, uh, again, these are Rosalie Tompkins quilts. And we see that she has some small triangles of what we call half square triangles. She sewn those together, but, and, what an impact that makes because we can see the patterns, we can see the colors. And there's a joke that quilters like to take a piece of fabric and cut it all up and then sew it back together. So what a difference it makes when that's, these pieces of triangles are sewn back together. My first, one of my first assignments from Marion was to make a large quilt. Next slide. So I thought I can do that I can get a big piece of green fabric, a big piece of blue fabric, and I can fill in this canvas. But she said, now cut all of those fabrics up into small pieces. So as you can see, it made a big difference in these leaves when I cut them up in the triangles. But you can imagine the look on my face when she said, cut up all of those fabrics into little pieces. The title of this quilt is A Walk in the Forest. Uh, quilters have fabrics that they don't like to cut up. Maybe it's a fabric that someone gave them or they collected on a trip. But when the right project comes along, then we don't mind cutting it up. Next quilt, please. Next, next slide. Um, in 2014, Marion Coleman curated a show about Oakland. And um, you mentioned that this story was picked up by the New York Times. And as you can see, is in the arts section. So on the front page of the arts section, not the home section, but the 
art section and that's a big change for us quilters. My quilt is titled Black Filmmakers Hall of Fame and um, it's about a group of people whose mission was to recognize people of color that had been ignored by Hollywood. So uh, every year, every February, we had a big gala and they gave Oscar Michaud awards. Oscar Michaud was a black producer and director of films in the, I think in the, in the 1920s and the 1930s. My quilt included um, the Paramount Theater in Oakland where the gala was held. It included names of some of the people who were awarded the award. Um, and it also uh, included an actual Oscar Michaud stamp that you know you can mail from the, at the US, United States Post Office. And it's in the upper right corner under that star. Um, this is a narrative quilt or a story quilt as we've been talking about. And I'm a retired school librarian. So we always respect the story, whether it's a biography or a history book or a folk tale. And we often talk about primary sources like newspapers and other historical document. So as Carolyn has said before, I heard her say that each quilt is a historical document that African-American quilters create from their lived experiences. And this is the story that we are trying to tell. And Rosalie Tompkins quilts, she often include like birth dates of families and you know, other information that you know of her relationship with her families. Uh, quilters often include words to help them tell the story and words are powerful. So those are often included in the quilt. Next, please. Excuse me. In this quilt, um, this part of an exhibition um, and uh, when George Floyd was killed right before our eyes, you know, quilters and a lot of other people had a need to speak out. They needed to say something. They needed to speak about the violence, sort of like op-eds about what was going on. So um, this is a virtual quilt show that was mentioned, Gone But Never Forgotten. It was cur curated by Carolyn. Uh, the title of my quilt is And Counting because in this quilt, I decided that, or I thought about the fact that in 1619, the first ship of Africans were brought here and made slaves. So uh, it's been a long, long time and we still keep counting since that time. We're counting the minutes it took George Floyd to be killed while he lay there dying. So there are a lot of things that we're counting. I, in the center of this quilt, I included the names of uh, some of the people who had been killed by the police. And before I could finish the quote, another person was in the news of having been killed, shot in the back actually by the police. So my quote is, uh, and counting, and how long do we have to keep counting these acts? Next quote, please. Next slide. <laughs> this quote is, um, again, um, in an exhibit, it was in an exhibit called We Who Believe in Freedom. And when I did this quote with Marion, um, we were doing a traditional log cabin blocks. It's my first uh, try at a traditional kind of quilt. And the pattern is called courthouse steps. But for me, that uh, started another story because um, I grew up in Alabama and with schools that were separate, but unequal. And this led me to think, okay, Brown versus Board of Education for these courthouse steps. So in the quilt, in this narrative quilt, I included uh, the plaintiffs who were in that case. I included the lawyers, you can see that in the detail, the NAACP lawyers who argued the case at the court. Uh, it included the cases leading up to Brown versus Board of Education. And it also included the psychologists who, um, presented their study about the black and white dolls that swayed the judge's opinion. So again, the quilts have a story and um, the narrative quilts, and it's also a history. Next quilt. Next slide. <laughs> uh, this Rosalie Tompkins quilt. Um, I saw this quilt at the, in the exhibition and I was looking at it. And it the top of the quilt we see, but we can't see the back of it. And I read the annotation 
It said, found and repurposed neckties made of polyester, silk, brocade, and polyester knit, and other fabrics with cotton muslin backings. Quote about Irene Backhead, 42 by 38 inches. Uh, and as you can see, this is very, very different from the quilts that we've shown by Rosalie Tompkins. You know, it looks like she used a wide section of a, man, of a man's necktie. Um, neckties are a popular source of fabrics for not just for quilters, but for art projects. Um, the fabrics, um, again, we talk about recycle and repurpose. So that's what we're doing with men's neckties. And a lot of men have a big collection of neckties. So sometimes um, quilts are used to honor husbands and fathers and grandfathers, you know, with these quilts. Um, next, please. I made a necktie quilt and my source of neckties was the men's department at the Oakland Museum White Elephant Sale, where I'm a volunteer. So I collected some of these, I purchased some of these from the uh, sale because I love the colors, they're 100% silk, they are designer neckties and the fabrics were just beautiful. So I collected them, I didn't quite know what I was gonna do with them, but one day when the problem was cloudy, I didn't have another project in hand, I wanted to look work with something really pretty, something really bright. So I pulled out my box of neckties. Um, in order to, for me to work with the neckties, I had to take them apart or deconstruct them. Since it's silk, sort of hard to work with. So I used spray starch, I cut them into strips and arranged them on a muslin back and like strip piece them. Next please. Uh, so the first part of the quilt, uh, the blocks with the strip piecing, but I also saved the labels and in one of Rosalie Compton's quilts, they talk about ready-made tags. So as quilters, we tend to save those things that we can still include on our quilts. So as you can see, these labels have some fancy names, you know, Christian Dior, Pierre Cardin. So those are fancy names that I wanted to keep and I applied those to a second section of my quilt. And I was thinking that these labels probably attended some fancy parties and, you know, so I did want to keep them. But as I, when I started this quilt, I didn't have a plan other than to work with some beautiful fabrics and to um, put it together. So I had two sections of the quilt, but I still, the quilt still needed something else. So in art, there's a rule of three. So I said, okay, so there's a third section that has to be added to this quilt. As I said, when I started, I didn't have a plan, but obviously to me, the quilt had a plan. Uh, during the Jim Crow era, there were postcards made and you saw men in white shirts and ties dressed in their Sunday best with picnic baskets. And they were attended what they called a necktie party. And if you look up necktie party, it was a lynching. So now the quilt had a plan and a name. Next, please. On this third section, I wanted to, uh, oh, I did, I made a drawing of a man being lynched and I outlined it on the beige side of the fabric. So this is the third section of the quilt. Uh, the man is there hanging from a tree. And I did it in beige on a beige background because I didn't want that to be the first thing you would see when you looked at this book. But if you look closely, and I hope you can see it, you can see that man in the beige, the beige thread hanging from a tree. So the quilt was still not finished with me. Uh, next slide, please. On the back of a quilt, we use what we call sometimes a forgiven fabric. It means we don't want to see the thread on the back of the quilt, but I didn't have enough of that forgiven fabric. So I had a leftover block that I wasn't going to use because it was too dark. And I just pieced it on the back. And this was not planned, but when I turned the quilt over, I had a chill right up and down my spine because there was the hanging man, very clear, and I did not plan this. So 
to me, he was saying, you have to remember this happened. Don't forget it. Don't try and overlook it. Next, please. Uh, Rosalie Tompkins Quilts gives us a glimpse of who she was personally, spiritually, her relationship with her family, the community, the world. And that's what quilters do. We're telling our story as to who we are, what's important to us as African-Americans, the story of our presence as people of color and of this United States of America. Thank you. Goodness, um, Aura and Carolyn, um, thank you so much. If um, just based on where you are, everybody, just maybe give some appreciation for our guests and just um, sharing uh, so much of their, you know, insights into their process and their experience and their expertise, um, most of all. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for, for that. Um, you know, just to maybe to start off our conversation, I um, would also just love for both of you to reflect upon quilting. And now, Carolyn, I'll say you didn't, you talked mostly from your perspective as a curator and you didn't really, you didn't even show us any of your own work as a quilter. But um, I would both of you to maybe speak a little bit about what, um, how you came to quilting, because as I understand it, you both came to the art form later in life as adults, um, and what quilting means to you now. Um, yes, I did come into quilt making later in my life. Um, I had no one in my family that made quilts. Um, I just happened to be in Dallas back in the late 70s at the trade market and saw a quilt that a cooperative had from that made quilts in Appalachia. It was an Appalachian co uh, cooperative. And I fell in love with that quilt that was in the showroom. And it was a very traditional patchwork pattern in the middle and in the corner it had an eagle, an eagle applique in each corner. And of course there was a big sign there saying not to touch the quilts, but I think quilt makers are the worst offenders for this. <laughs> I had to touch the quilt and I, I, I wanted to feel it and I couldn't wait for people to turn their back so I could touch that quilt. But I was living in LA at the time and I decided right there in that showroom, I wanted to learn how to quilt. And I went back to LA, I got a how-to quilt book and uh, that book I still have by Sunset Press. I decided to make a nine patch quilt and I wanted it to be an authentic American quilt with cotton batting, not poly bat which was really popular at the time. And I made the little nine patch uh, top, but I couldn't find anything but polyester, poly bat. And so what I did, I went to the drug store and I got some cartons of first aid cotton. And um, this was back in the day, I think it was called Blue Cross cotton. It was a little it, uh, little square of cotton, maybe about four or five inches square. And I just got a bag of it, these boxes and came home and unfolded the, uh, unfurled the little uh, rolls and laid them out. And uh, <laughs> I kept running out because the, the, the little patches were so small, the little, uh, boxes of cotton and I had gone to the pharmacy so many times the druggist one day stopped me and he said Dr. Maz I don't know who's sick in your house but please I think you should get them to the hospital right away <laughs> uh, that was that that was my first sewing experience and I didn't wash the pieces like I I should have I didn't pre-wash them but I washed them when my kids who were, ba were babies then, they got it dirty, I washed it. 
it looks like a three-dimensional fried egg quilt because the, the, the quilt in the middle sets up about a foot off the bed. <laughs> it's, it was a terrible quilt, you know, and but that was my that was my first experience uh, trying to make a quilt. And I've just come to love quilts. I like being able to tell a story. I like to be able, you know, to uh, celebrate the status of women in my quilts. And I want to talk about my culture and the ups and downs of what I've experienced as an African-American living in this country. So these quilts are like my diaries. They're mm -hmm. like my diaries. And I, can, I cannot imagine my life not being able to make quilts. Um, it's just like second nature to me now. I, I enjoy it. Oh gosh, thank you for that. Um, to say that quilting is like your diary, it, it really impresses that personal aspect of what, what the quilt, what quilts allow you to do. Um, yeah, Aura, would you like to share a little bit about how you came to quilting? Well, actually my experience or relationship with quilting started a long time ago. My mother made quilts. I didn't learn from my mother to make a quilt because I didn't think I didn't realize, you know, that I could, but she made quilts to keep us warm. And that was the whole purpose of the quilts. I was really, really cold in Alabama during the winter time. And she made quilts for our beds. I mean, there were no blankets. And it's interesting hearing Carolyn talk about the cotton uh, batting because we grew the cotton that went into the batting for the quilts. Uh, when the cotton was, was uh, picked and taken to the gin, seeds were taken out and a fluffy bag of cotton was brought back so my mother could use it for the batting for the quilts. So the quilts was really heavy, nice and heavy, but you needed that to keep warm. Um, so I only saw quilts as something to keep us warm. And it was only after I was an adult that I realized, oh, so quilts can be art quilts also. And that's when I started working with Marion was my first mm -hmm. experience with actually making a quilt. And even working with Marion, I started with uh, four by six postcards. And uh, because a quilt seems so <laughs> unimaginable, a, a bed quilt, a big, so I, but I could do a postcard. So we did postcards and then we went to 12 by 12 inch blocks. And so finally we did get to the larger quilts, but uh, that was my first experience uh, with quilts. So. Mm. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, for um, the next question that I, the next topic I'd love to, um, to delve into is this topic of spirituality. And um, maybe for now, I'll put up this slide because um, the title of Jeanette Miller's quilt, Spirit of the Cloth, I'm stirring my mind in this direction. Um, and, uh, and that has to do about thinking about fabric and thinking about how it lends itself to um, sort of exploring issues of spirituality. And so I guess my question for you both is, well, is just that, is there something particular about fabric that lends itself well to, I guess, not just creative expression, but in thinking about issues of spirituality? For me, the cloth is special. Cloth is special because we as human beings have a lifelong affair with cloth. Mm. This is the first thing we're swathed in at birth. It's the last thing that touches our body upon our death. And indeed, the cloth does have a spirit. It has a voice um, in its color and the patterns. They speak to us. Um, I've often thought that making quilts is, is a form of worship. It's a form of worship. I like the actual quilting. 
that's my favorite part, quilting on the machine. It's very repetitive. I find it meditative. It's very relaxing. And I often say God doesn't make mistakes. So when we make a quilt, I don't think there's any such thing as a bad quilt. <laughs> uh, when we put that binding on it and put it out there, it's perfect. I don't care what form it's in. Um, we wouldn't have been able to finish it if it wasn't just so. Um, so again, I think making a quilt is like, like worship. Um, and especially there's something in Rosie's quilts that um, speak to that, the need of protection, having protection, that spiritual protection to uh, surround her in her quilts. Somebody asked the question, uh, they were saying that the, I was talking about the artist's voice and they said that the quilts are Rosie's voice and they express how she feels and that's important. And they express how she wants to be remembered. Um, they express her design sense, but still lacking is her voice. We sit here and we're interpreting, especially her quilts that deal with religion. Mm -hmm. These are our interpretations because there's no written um, sense as to what Rosie Tompkins meant with any of these quilts. We're, we're interpreting her voice as we see uh, what she has on her quilts. She may be thinking something totally different. And early on when I came into quilt making, that was something that was lacking. Mm -hmm. Something written by the uh, quilt maker as to what their quilt quilts meant. A lot of the quilts were, uh, the early writings were uh, from white scholars who just looked at the work and interpreted, tried to interpret what the quilt maker was saying without, the, without even asking them. Mm -hmm. And later on, when, when uh, my colleague Gwen McGee and uh, Questa Benberry would talk to some of these very same quilters and we would read from these quilt books what was said about their work. And they would tell us, no, that's not what I meant uh, when I made that particular piece. I'll never forget, I was at the Spencer Museum to give a lecture for a show. I was standing outside the auditorium waiting for my turn to speak. And the speaker that was at the podium at the time was speaking about this wonderful work that had all these signs and symbols of Africa uh, that he related in, in, in the quilt. And I thought, geez, the sign and sy uh, symbols were just so deep in nature. And I thought, gee, that has to be like a really special quilt with a, with, with, uh, a lot of connection to uh, the quilt maker's African roots. And I, I opened the auditorium door to peek at the quilt and the guy was talking about my quilt. I didn't know what he was talking about because that was not my intent at all when I made the quilt. So this is why when I talk about the voice of the quilt maker, I'm talking about the actual statement that the quilters make about their work. The contemporary quilters with whom I work the Women of Color Quilters Network and Friends, for every exhibition that we've done, there's a catalog. And in that catalog, there are statements about the inspiration and what the quilters meant in their work. It is not left up to my interpretation or anybody else's interpretation. Um, 
what that quilter meant. So this is the voice that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the uh, uh, actual voice of the quilt maker. And in this instance, this we're, we're talking about Rosie's work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Also, Elaine, can I just add to that? Also, you mentioned fabric. Um, and even before we put fabric into a quilt, we also have a relationship with just with fabric itself. I mean, if we go on a trip and I see a beautiful piece of fabric, I buy it. Quilters have a stash of fabrics. Um, what we wear, you know, is fabric and it speaks something about who we are with what we choose to wear also. And as a quilter, I can see someone wearing something and I would say, that would make a great quilt. So, but, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a dress or whatever. But um, so I also think it's the fabric also, you know, handling the fabric, using the fabric, that's also very um, satisfying to quilters. Um, so I think the relationship starts there also until we go into actually putting it into a quilt or deciding how to put it into a quilt. So mm. the relationship is a long standing relationship. <laughs> no, thank you for that insight. Um, I think it reminds me, it may, and it makes me think of Rosie Lee Tompkins and Velvet mm. and Velvet Team, right? So the fact that she created and imposed so many tops using that material, I mean, there was sort of a clear preference or and a clear love of how it looked, how it must have felt in her hands. And so, yes, everything you're saying, Aura, um, makes me think of that resonance too. Um, wow, it's already almost three. Um, there is um, There are two topics that I'd love to um, touch on with you both. And let me just find a quilt example here. Um, I'd love to show this one. This is one of Rosie Lee Tompkins, what she called three sixes, um, because they, these quilts of this orange, purple, and yellow were um, meant to commemorate members of her family. These are family members whose birthday all had the number six in them. Um, and so this, this is a question about family and the role that community play in quilts made by African-American artists. Um, and I would love to invite both of you to speak a little bit from your experiences about the role of family in your work. Well, the, the concept of home becomes profoundly important for displaced people. And despite uh, assertions to the contrary, slavery did not erase uh, African-American people's reverence for family and uh, kinfolk. There's a lot of documented e uh, evidence that enslaved people went to great lengths uh, to try and keep their families intact whenever they uh, possibly could. And at this time, when we see so many families experiencing profound disruptions, it's not surprising for me to see that artists and both family memories in their quilts. And um, in some ways, the artist is kind of setting the record straight since the uh, Black family structure has been much maligned in scholarly works and in the media. And I would like to believe that these hand, the, the quilts are a celebration of not only family, but a testament to Black creativity and our endurance and resilience and who we are. So we keep our family close. Even for me as a quilt maker, this is how I, I, I love to use my grandchildren and uh, their faces in my quilts. And I've spent my hmm, sequestered pandemic time making quilts that um, are about my grandchildren. Because of the pandemic, I can't see them like I want to. I can't touch them. I can't hug them like I want to, but I can touch them in my quilts. So I choose to uh, make these quilts to keep me close to my grandchildren. 
So family, family is very important, very, very important. So um, they form one of the mainstays of what I make as a quilt maker in so far as themes. I agree with Carolyn. Our families are our inspirations. Uh, they are convenient models for us because my quote, A Walk in the Forest was from a photo I took of my husband and my daughter. So we look to family for that inspiration. Um, and uh, when I took this photograph, uh, and then when I went to make the quilt, I wanted to give my husband a red hat. And he said, I don't wear red hats. This was before the recent election. But uh, so he said, I wear blue hats. So, I mean, they have a say also, but they are definitely an inspiration for those. Also in the necktie quilts, a lot of times the mm -hmm. neckties from a collection are used to honor that person. Maybe the grandfather had a collection of neckties and uh, the quilter wanted to make something to remember and to honor him. So family just plays such a great part in our quilts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I would love to, you know, speaking of having quilters and their voices represented, I would love to ask um, you, Aura, about um, your process and some of your, the decisions you make, because we also have a couple of questions um, that maybe I can group them together and if you wouldn't mind maybe um, talking about some of them. We do have, um, one question from Marilyn who asks if you can explain some of the techniques you use to include text on your quilts. Um, and personally, I would love to hear more about, um, you know, how the, di the different decisions you make about the, di the how your quilting designs. And when I mean, just the actual act of quilting, you know, sandwiching your three layers together and um, how, uh, and that came up for me looking at your 1619 quilt where you can, I can see so many different kinds of lines. It's almost like you're drawing with your quilting. Um, so yeah, I would love for you to speak on, there was a question about the text and then I would love to hear more about your quilting styles. This quilt includes both of those texts and the quilting style. Um, for text, um, there's several ways of adding text to quilts and quilters, use all of those. Uh, we try and use what will best fit or what uh, we can do at the time. For these texts, um, I printed them out on a printer, uh, inkjet printer, um, and I made a stencil for these and then cut out the stencil on fabric. Um, the fabric had been uh, also pre prepared with uh, an interfacing, um, an adhesive interfacing, so that I could iron those, once they were cut out, I could iron them on the quilt. And then the next step was to do an applique stitch on the very edge, so called raw edge applique, where I didn't turn them, I just went around the very edge of all of those numbers and all of those letters. So uh, raw edge applique is what a lot of quilters use. Um, for some of the other stitching, um, it's sort of like what fits best. Um, and I use a lot of free motion quilt quilting and where you're filling up the spaces with uh, stitches and that's meandering going wherever the machine leads you or wherever you uh, take the fabric. So free motion quilting is what I do a lot of the time. And raw edge applique uh, for most of the letters. Um, the ship itself was printed on uh, organza fabric. And again, I use an inkjet printer to print that photograph or that picture or that image on the fabric. And then again, that's applique onto the quilt. Um, and this is, yeah, I guess, what was the question? The numbers and the letters and and the quilting. So I do a lot of free motion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
I'd love to uh, ask you both about um, museums and quilts, just to shift gears a little bit, um, you know, because something that a theme that's come up in our discussion and in your comments is both about how quilting can start at such a personal, profoundly personal level. And it's also really motivated by, by the personal and the intimate, as in, you know, thinking about one's family or different relationships. Um, and there are also objects that you can live with, right? As blank functional, or, you know, they are often made in the home. Um, and so I'd love to ask if you think that once quilts sort of are on display in museums, do they lose? Um, and even if so, you know, is it why are museums important? Are they important in, um, in sort of having quilts on display? I would love just to hear some of your thoughts about, um, about museum exhibitions and quilts. I think museum exhibitions are important. They give an opportunity for uh, viewers and patrons to see quilts they otherwise may not see. Um, they have an opportunity to uh, look at issues, view quilts that address issues that they may, may be unfamiliar with. A good example, the series of seven exhibitions I curated in, in uh, Minneapolis all deal with various issues of uh, some aspect of race in America. Um, a lot of African-American history, white folks don't know. A lot of young black folks don't know. So it's an opportunity to educate people and start a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, it's also important to me, I, I want to see that quilts have a, a repository of quilts that scholars can come and study. I think that's important um, to get a glimpse into our uh, American history, African-American history. It's important to learn from these quilts because as I said earlier on, the quilts are like uh, historical documents that mm -hmm. tell the story of our country community and ourselves and family. So this is important and it's important that, um, that the quilts be preserved and, uh, and shared. Mm -hmm. Also, just adding to that, I think as the quilter, it's a great vehicle for us to speak our voice. And sometimes we might not be in the street protesting, but our quilt is a protest. It's a way to say, you know, I don't like what's going on or, you know, it's painful what's going on. So I think there is a place and the museums give us that place to speak our voice and to let it be known by others. So we just did these quilts and kept them at home, we wouldn't be speaking, we wouldn't be letting other people know how we feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, and I, I think that's so clear. This dynamic you're explaining is so clearly manifest, Carolyn, in just the series of juried experts that you put together in Minneapolis, right? There's a way that um, your work is able also to respond to a moment and to harness the voice of so many artists and quilters in your network and to, yeah, offer, offer our country a way of understanding, understanding the social justice implications of so much that's happening. And I want to add that the series of seven exhibitions in Minneapolis were not only from, uh, were made by the Women of Color Quilters Network, but it was an international show that mm. included people from other countries and um, all cultures, races were in that, are in that exhibition because when you think about the murder of George Floyd, really that was a clarion call around the world, okay, for uh, race, unity and reconciliation. So it was not just about us here, and that's what that exhibition is also about. Um, it brought together a uh, 
lot of different cultures and races under the under one umbrella um, having this forum for uh, making quilts about race in America. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, thought I'd take an opportunity. I'm going to shift us to some of our audience questions. Just I want to be mindful of um, everybody's time. Um, so we have, let's see, um, you know, Carolyn, you alluded to this, but Carol um, has a question for both of you. Um, she asks, how does it feel when others see different stories in the quilt other than the one you intended? <laughs> okay. I I didn't quite hear you, but I, I saw the question. Oh, mm -hmm. um, for me, as a quilt collector and historian, it bothers me, okay, that I'm here and I made the quilt and I have documentation as to what the quilt means, what was the inspiration behind that quilt and you know, it depends on how you interpret it. If you're really way off base, then <laughs> I've missed the mark as to uh, what I made the quilt for. And then, too, it's even more so of a problem if you write about, and scholars have done this and they still do it, if you write about the quilt and give your interpretation and you know, what my inspiration is, is just off the table. Mm -hmm. Then you should have made the quilt and not me. <laughs> uh, as I said earlier though, but I like it when I go to a quilt show and the quilter is standing there and we can ask questions, we can say, turn it to the back so we can see the back. Quilters like to see the back of quilts because sometimes that's just as interesting as seeing the front of the quilt. So if the quilter is there, then we can get the true story. And you know, like Carolyn says, sometimes if someone else is telling us, it may not be the true story, but uh, you know, I, that's, that's, that's the source of the information really is the quilter. Mm. On another note too, yeah. Some of, you, some of uh, uh, Rosie's quilts, the, the tops were made and um, they were sent out. Eli had them sent out to be quilted. That's and it. in the catalog, it's noted that those tops were so bumpy and, and clumpy and the quilt, the quilter, reconstructed the quilts. I have a problem with that because is there a before and after picture? Mm. Okay. For, the, for that particular quilt, I know which one you're talking that, about. There, yeah, for, there is not. Okay, so then when we talk about voice, okay, maybe she had one original intent when she did that uh, that particular piece, but then when it's reconstructed, we don't know, we don't know what what uh, how that took place and what was added and how that quilt was changed. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think what you're know. talking about. Yep, is this one right here, that opening one? Was that the only quilt that was reconstructed? Mm -hmm. You can say that's the only quilt that you know of that was exactly that's the one that's the one that that's we know quilt. of exactly. And this is why documentation is important. You know, I, I look at all these little things. Uh, it, it to me, it's critical. Maybe I'm being too picky, but I don't think so. <laughs> um. Just while we're on the topic of documentation and um, and sort of the archival importance of you know curatorial work, um, there is a, a question from Melissa who asks, um, "What books would you 
both recommend that highlight African-American quilters. And I would assume, you know, that you would recommend because they do a good job of doing this work of documentation. Oh, wow. There are a multitude of them when you look at the catalogs. My favorite book uh, is a book that I wrote for a show, And Still We Rise, Race, Culture, and Visual Conversations. And I curated the exhibition and wrote the book in mind, having in mind the quadricentennial anniversary, 400 year anniversary of the landing of first Africans in, in this country in 1619. And the quilts are displayed in a timeline from 1619 to um, present day with important events and people uh, and topics that have, uh, that are important to not only African-American culture, but American culture. And it talks about the contributions that have been made as well by African-Americans in this country. And the um, quilts are accompanied by the a statement and inspiration from the quilt makers Somebody uh, also mentioned um, the show that I spoke about earlier that I curated on jazz. It was called Textural Rhythms, Quilting the Jazz Tradition, mm -hmm. where uh, 60 quilters chose some aspect of jazz, whether it be their favorite jazz uh, song or performance or musician, and they interpreted that in a quilt. And that was a very extensive catalog. It uh, featured the statements and inspirations of the quilt makers as well. And I think Roland Freeman's book, Communion of the Spirits, is like, for me, the Bible mm -hmm. of African-American quilt making. And um, that's my first choice, Communion of the Spirits. Um, it's what about? 25 years old, mm -hmm. maybe older, but it's still quite relevant in the field. Yeah. Um, Roland Freeman went across this country for two years documenting African-American quilts. And it, it's quite an extensive survey, um, not only of quilt making, but into the quilters' lives and communities that they live in. That book is, is fabulous, fabulous reference. Yeah, and um, just for um, Melissa who asked that question, I think um, another book by Glad Dr. Gladys Marie Fry about antebellum quilts, um, unfortunately I don't have the title at my fingertips right now, um, but I think her work is really helpful in understanding what gets lost when we don't have documentation and how challenging it is to sort of even to do some of that historical research when one, you know, Carolyn, as you've noted, rightly so, um, when you have a group of people who have been dispossessed and have no recourse of keeping their own records um, about quilt making, um, you know, there are sort of these absences in the historical record that doesn't mean, for example, that we're not African-American enslaved quilters or people who were not producing um, or and not making quilts, um, you know, in the 18th century, in the 19th centuries. Um, so I would recommend Dr. Gladys Marie Fry's book um, just as a way of, I think, you know, she, her research found examples and really, really, um, surprising for me examples of the way that um, even quilts made by enslaved people don't necessarily, you know, just the narratives are so surprising. Yeah, Carolyn, did you want to jump in? Yes, we cannot forget about Quest of Ben Berry's book, Always mm -hmm. There. Okay. Thank you. Quest of Ben Berry and Roland Freeman are like the mainstays of, of uh, African-American quilt history. And Always There was a groundbreaking book as well. Mm -hmm. no, thank you, thank you for that. Um, let's see. Um, 
I'm gonna just give me a second to look at some of these other questions. Um, so um, Aura, there is a question for you um, from Talithia who asks, um, or who says, you mentioned your mother's quilting. Um, did your mother teach you? How old were you? And if you have a daughter, have you passed on this art to her? And she congratulates you on your beautiful work. Thank you, Talithia. Um, I, I was there, my mother was quilting, but I guess I was too busy doing other things. So I did not learn from my mother, as I said. And after I retired from being a school librarian, I had collected a lot of quilting books, but I had no quilts and didn't know how to make a quilt. So it wasn't until my daughter took me to the class at the uh, MOAD in uh, San Francisco, class taught by Marion Coleman that I actually started thinking, oh yes, I can do this and I would like to do this. So that's where I started. So my daughter took me to the class and now that um, she's with me, she's also has some quilts started and she's also finished, I think two quilts already. So, uh, so yes, the, uh, the knowledge and the language goes on. Um, wonderful. Um, so I think I, I'll, I'll just ask one last question because um, I think this will be a nice way to uh, to tie up our, our time together. And it's from Rosie who um, asks, what advice do you both have for the next generation of self-taught quilters? She's asking specifically about self-taught, especially those of us interested in narrative quilt making. For me, I think uh, it's important to do what you feel in your heart, what your spirit tells you to do. Um, that's important. To me, it's, it's, it's everything to do what you want to do and not, uh, not what others do. I think we all come from an, a background of traditional quilt making where you have to learn the skills to make the quilts. And then after you learn those skills, you pretty much do what you want to do. And uh, the sky is the limit in so far as the stories and the techniques. I have quilters that I work with um, that come up with new techniques all the time and new ways of doing things. And technology adds to that. Um, there's so much to make quilting an easier endeavor than it was 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. So I think just do what your spirit tells you to do and not be constrained by rules. I would also suggest uh, joining a support group like the African-American uh, Quilting Gale of Oakland it's a great group, you know, we meet, I mean, it's a place to ask questions, it's a place to say, how do you do that? So joining a gill or joining a group, a support group will also help with that. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, well, Carolyn and Aura, um, we're so grateful to both of you for sharing your afternoon with us and for sharing of your work your life's work. <laughs> um, so I hope, yes, wherever you are, please just, again, give some appreciation for our guests. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and as far as Rosie Lee, please keep checking the museum website. We are hopeful to reopen in the spring. Um, and uh, we hope to see you in our gallery soon. Thank you again to everybody. <laughs>